What is up, Fence fam? So good to see you guys again. It's actually going to be one of our last Saturday broadcasts for the next several weeks. You know, we've got FinSet coming up, which is, if you read the description, you know that this is going to be a shorter than usual broadcast because we essentially have to pack this whole studio up and get it uh, boxed up, crated up, and on its way down to New Orleans so we can set up a studio down there. Because those of you in the Fence fam know, FinSec is coming up. It's right around the corner. It's actually uh board meetings i believe start monday down there so uh classes start tuesday i believe show floor wednesday thursday half day friday and then we uh hustle back here to springfield now the reason i'm not going to be doing a live saturday is we've got another fundraiser i'm in this group called springfield sertoma we raise money for area children's charities usually around a hundred thousand dollars a year give or take um it actually might be a little bit more than that now with uh we've got several Several, uh, I don't know, events throughout the year. This one's chili cook-off. So if you guys are in Southwest Missouri, I see a friend in over, over in Oklahoma, Nick's here. Nick Spears is here in the comments. Uh, if you happen to be in the uh, Springfield area, Nick, you ought to stop by. It's a pretty good time. Anyway, Saturday, raising money for kids. No live, uh, no live broadcast Saturday. And then we pack all this. Well, we don't pack it all up. It's going to stay packed up. And then we're going to ship it off to Tennessee, up to Nashville, for Standing University, where we're going to hope to film some more content uh, at Standing University for you guys. I, I think we're we're taking everything with us to Nashville because I believe we're going to try to set up a live that Saturday. So maybe two weeks from today. Now, I say maybe because it depends on – there's a lot of variables involved, right? So uh, primarily is the internet uh, there enough to support a live stream because with all this video and audio, there's a lot going on. Anyway, last broadcast for the next couple of weeks, probably. But then after Staining University, we're back for several weeks uh, before we leave off again to social media marketing world. Now, well, I'll just leave it. There could be um, there could be some bonus content coming from the trip out to San Diego. We've talked to a couple of vendors that are out there in California, kind of around San Diego area, and uh, we might be filming additional content for you guys. So look forward to that. Guys, let's say hello to who who's here in the comments. I was going to say whoever's here. You're all here, right? Kelly has been patiently waiting. Kelly Baggett. Baggett? Baggett? Kelly, I'm sorry. I just, I butchered that. If you know me, you know I am not great with names. Kelly's been here, though, for the last hour and a half. Kelly, if you're still here, thank you. She showed up really early. As always, Project Metal Music is here from Sunderland. Hello, how are you? Good afternoon, right? I always have to do the time change real quick. Good afternoon to you guys. Actually, there's several here. Oh, there's Kelly again. Sorry. Hello from the UK. You got it. Nick Spears is here. I'm Nick, your neighbor over in Oklahoma. Welcome, Nick. Like I said, if you're in the area next weekend, let me know. I actually have tickets for uh, Chili Cook-Off, so if you'd like to come, if you're in the area, let me know. I'll get you hooked up with some tickets. Wallace is also here. Good morning to you, Wallace. Thank you. I appreciate it. So something interesting happened this week. We've got a little bit larger of an audience from over in the UK. Uh, welcome, if you're new here, first and foremost. So uh, those of you that follow the channel know that I follow DJ Projects that over in Nottingham in the UK. I like those guys a lot. They have great content. If you haven't watched your content, you should check it out. I enjoy watching it. Uh, but in one of the, in one of the videos recently, I say recently, maybe several weeks ago, uh, Stevie had mentioned that their, their tripod just was not up to snuff. It was not, it was just falling apart, frankly. So, uh, I saw that video. I said, you know what I can do? I can send him a tripod tripod. It's a Manfrotto tripod. The one that I, I like using when we're making, uh, content out in the field or just on site content, really, um, sent that over to him. Well, then they did a shout out on one of their videos and encouraged their folks to come over and follow the channel. So if you're here because of that, thank you and welcome. Always happy to help for sure. <laughs> Kelly says, I can, I can see too if orange is actually your favorite color. It is. Uh, quite literally, everything here is orange. Everything down to the watch and the ring and gosh, what else? Probably hard to see. 
XLR cord, XLR cords, which is what makes the music go here, or the audio go here. Gosh, I mean, really, when I'm buying things anymore, the question is always, does it come in orange? Because if so, I'm going to want that option. Uh, just as I'm looking around the room, there's just orange everything. Um, so we did a video, Kelly. Gosh, it's been, what's it been, guys? Maybe a year or so ago. Uh, why I love orange. So I think, so in the con, in the, in my pages toolbar, the search bar, you could probably just search orange. And I bet that video is going to show up after this one, of course. Um, but yeah, orange is the thing. So it's, it's color branding, Kelly. It's, uh, well, and it's a safety color here in the States. It's a safety color. So if we're on a commercial side, it helps us stay visible. And I mean, we, when we're on residential sites, it helps us stay visible as well. But we really just kind of took it and ran with it. I've got a friend here in town and runs a plumbing and HVAC business who their color is yellow. And this family goes all in. As much as you think I go in on orange, they go further in with yellow. It's quite literally everywhere. If it's yellow or something, it's probably them. Um, so I, I kind of took a put, uh, page out of their book, um, went all in with the orange. And I tell you, the seminal moment for this was I was sitting in a, um, and I probably go, I probably talk about this in that video, but I was sitting at a, a trade show at a business conference or business expo where we're wanting to meet other business people in the community and talk to them about if they need some fence. Um, but at the time, our colors were blue with gold lettering, very regal. Um, but as I'm looking at this crowd, so our, our platform is slightly elevated. And as I'm looking over the crowd, I realized something that probably 90% of the shirts in this room were blue. I mean, it was a sea of blue and we were blending in. And when you're doing marketing, when you're wanting to stand out, the last thing you want to do is blend in. You just get lost in the crowd. So that was kind of the day that solidified it in my mind that it's time to go orange. Well, a bright color. And then I was like, well, we do orange already for the, for our team members out in the field. So they can stay visible. I think it's time that everybody goes orange and we did. So orange, it is orange is everywhere. Uh, I've actually been, uh, been a little restricted from the things I buy at the house because I always buy orange. I think it's hilarious when we just fill the house with orange things. Um, my wife does not find that hilarious. Hello, Taylor, if you're watching. Um, so Taylor makes a purchasing decisions in the house because she's tired of orange everywhere. So anyway, orange is a bit of our thing. So guys, let's do this. Let's answer any questions you guys have. I'd probably like to keep this somewhere around half an hour, 45 minutes. Uh, so amongst other things today, so we have to tear this down, box it up, get it ready to go. Uh, but then also this evening, Taylor and I are going out for Valentine's day. So we're leaving, uh, we're leaving Tuesday for, uh, New Orleans for fence tech. So it's going to rush things a little bit on Valentine's day. So we're doing Valentine's dinner early tonight. So it's a busy, hectic afternoon box. At, actually, before we create everything up, actually I had to run over to Academy to get another Pelican case. So busy, busy, busy. So half hour, 45 minutes. If you guys have questions or comments, leave them in the comments below. Also, as I said in the in the uh, banner there, as the clock was ticking, if you guys don't mind, hit the like button. It helps tremendously. Uh, if you guys if you guys are watching on YouTube, please subscribe if you haven't already. Uh, if you're watching on Facebook, go ahead and like and follow the page. And if you're watching on LinkedIn, send me an invite. Be glad to connect with you guys. Uh, yep. So just drop me your comments in the comments below, and we'll get going from there. Uh, so one thing I always like to do for those of you that this is your first time watching, I always like to preview to give you guys an early look at the video that's posting later on today. So while we wait for questions and comments to come in, we'll play that. Also, if you haven't said hello yet, say hello. Let us know you're here. See if we can't get this uh, technology figured out. There we go. So the video today is titled Manufacturers. Uh, let's see. Today's manufacturers have an advantage no one is talking about. So this is another video that we shot uh, up in uh, Wyoming at uh, Brenton Manufacturing. Briss and Brenton there is was kind enough just really to roll out the red carpet as I came in and uh, opened up his business to me, let me look around, see exactly how these machines work. But part of this was, I said, you know, we started having conversations out on the 
out on the warehouse floor and in Br in Briston's office. I said, you know, we ought to we got to film these conversations because I think they're important, and I th I think you guys would like to watch them. And I really just think it's important to document kind of where we are right now in the industry and where we think the industry is heading. I think it'd be interesting to look back in I don't know five ten years and see were we right, were we uh, wrong, where were we? So. Anyways, without further ado, let's watch this week's video. And again, if you guys have questions or comments, drop them in the comments below. Welcome back, everybody. Joe Everest, the fence expert. And we're hey, having a conversation with this, brand manufacturing. We've already talked about, before. we've taken a look at the chain link weaving machines. We've talked about galvanizing before versus galvanizing after. I haven't seen the comments yet, but I have the feeling there's a few good ones in there. Uh, the conversation I'd like to have today and to bring you guys into the conversation is the that manufacturers of today and tomorrow look very different than the manufacturers of yesteryear when we were kids sort of thing. And, and I really think I've had this discussion kind of off camera, I guess, but I really believe this is where the infrastructure is going or yeah. the supply chain is going in that, you know, we're, I think we're really getting away from warehouses full of hundreds of machines that are just constantly going and, you know, some in some in disrepair, that sort of thing. Yeah. Uh, more to facility. Does this outfit look familiar? I don't only have one shirt. Let's clear that misconception up right now. I actually have a closet full of these shirts. Um, and actually, that was one of the things the guys there at Britain asked: that, "Are you wearing the same shirt just like every day?" No, in fact, I brought four of them with me just in case uh, one got dirty. So, but I do think it is about time for a new hat unfortunately so this hat has been i want to say all it's yeah it's been down to mexico so i get this is this trout this hat has traveled internationally it's gone quite a ways so i think it's about time for a new hat but those of you that also follow c and still experts know there's a rebranding coming so i have a feeling there's going to be some new hats coming probably pick one up at fence tech maybe anyway i thought that was interesting have them have more than one of these shirts these that maybe have less than 20 machines yep uh, so here at Brent Manufacturing, you guys have four machines running. Yep. And that is an impressive operation to watch happen. I mean, it's it, you're bringing in all the strand, and there there's a mountain of strand out there. <laughs> there's a lot of it. We do a lot. Yeah. And it's all getting woven in, and, and in a matter of minutes, it goes from strand to a roll of chain link, yeah. and it's just over and over. Uh, impressive to watch. If you guys haven't watched the video where I go through and talk about the ins and outs of how these machines work, you should really check it out. Actually, we haven't posted that video yet. Um, I had an idea how I wanted the content put out there, but then as we got back and I got talking to Jeremy, the producer and all around behind the scenes guy, uh, we we had uh, kind of re rethought about our posting structure. So uh, the actual how the machine works video is still in the works. Uh, we've got all the content. I just need to splice it together. We need to splice it together and do a voiceover. Anyway, irregardless, don't think you've missed a video. That one's not out yet, but it will be coming soon. I got a kick out of just being able to sit and watch all that all that machinery work. But to get back to the point, uh, I really feel like operations such as yours are where things are going. My opinion, and I'd like to hear your opinion on it, my opinion is that you guys are probably more responsive to market demands. Yeah, absolutely. I think being uh, a little bit smaller, uh, it's more... You know, if we have a problem or if you're looking for quotes or, you know, customer service, I mean, you can get a hold of me. Yeah. Even. You know, where in big corporations, it's hard. You know, it's kind of a number system. You uh -huh. kind of work your way up the ladder. Um, I'm, a, you know, I, I give my salesmen and people uh, the right to make decisions. And, you know, I'm they can walk one office over, get an answer and have an answer for their customer in yep. in 10 seconds um so yeah i think it's kind of going that way um i think the hiring problem kind of going on in the united states if you got 100 machines it's hard to find 100 weavers you yeah. know yeah um so i kind of think that's gonna hurt the bigger operations um absolutely um so yeah it's well and you hit on something that i think is important to talk about and that's customer service yeah uh we had had a conversation off camera yesterday talking about how just in general, unfortunately, customer service is is all but completely gone, yeah. and and not just in manufacturing. I think you're seeing this in a lot of different steps in the fencing industry, or a lot of different phases in the fencing industry, because there's so much demand. Yep. Right. So there's there's more demand than supply, and so those with the supply are kind of in the position to 
pick and choose where that supply goes. Uh, and, and I feel like they know it. Yeah. Absolutely. You know, as, as a fence contractor in my fence business, I really get that feeling when talking, not all manufacturers, I'm not talking about all the suppliers, yeah. uh, but there are a few that really are just in over their heads and the customer service is completely gone. Yeah. Uh, to your point about quotes, quotes could take a day, two days. Uh, we put out a big fittings quote. Uh, it's been a, it's been probably a month ago now. And there was one supplier, a national brand that they took almost a week getting it back to us. And when they did, we'd already made our decision. Yeah. You know, we had, there was a few uh, suppliers in there that were pretty responsive. Um, but more than, more than not, we got, we had one bid that came in the day of, I sent it out. We got bid back. The rest of them were two, three days later. And this one was a week later. <laughs> And I think I think that's what you're seeing on on the corporate end, yeah, right absolutely. on these on these corporate manufacturer ends. Just maybe because their heads are are underwater, maybe due to the staffing issue, yeah. Uh, but the point remains yeah. that you know if we're looking for quotes on wire, that we can talk to you directly or right. Gabe. Yeah. You know, so what made this happen? The reason I'm sitting right here is uh, we had a, a reaction video of a different weaving machine. And I'd made a comment that, man, I'd really I'd like to watch one of these things run in person. These things are impressive. And I'm telling you what, guys, the day that video came out, Gabe shot me a message. He's like, hey, we'd love to have you out. We'd love to show you the machinery. And uh, I, I think that video, I'll have to go back and look at the calendar, but I think that video was only out a few weeks ago. It came out a few weeks ago. Yeah. So uh, talk about responsive. Yeah. Uh, you guys are on it for sure. Yeah. But just being able to be a fly on the wall here, I got to see that interaction where you guys were having just real-time conversations on supply coming in, strand coming in versus, you know, what orders were ready to go and all that. And it's, it's impressive to see how responsive you guys can be versus, you know, maybe one, maybe a larger operation. Yeah. Uh, in terms of responsiveness of like market demands, I'd also have to think. So the analogy I use is, you know, some of these large manufacturers are more like aircraft carriers. It takes a little bit of time to change directions. Yeah. Where, you know, you guys might be a cutter or something like that, a little bit more nimble. Yeah. To where if you see a uh, demand in the market, you know, if you start getting calls for, seven foot 11 gauge, something yeah. crazy. Uh, you could pretty easily change one of the machines over and start weaving seven foot 11 gauge. Yeah, right? absolutely. I mean, we got the capabilities of, you know, running anything to 12 foot and under, um, you know, any sleevage we need on those. Um, so yeah, for us to get a call, get a specialty order. Um, we had some, some weird orders we've done. Uh, we just sent some stuff out to North Carolina that was a three foot twist, twist, Really? Uh, yeah, nine gauge. So, <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's nice that those customers were able to call us up. And yeah. the reason that, you know, that it all went all the way to North Carolina is he kind of worked down the customer or the, the other manufacturers and how, how busy they are and the demand mm -hmm. for things. You know, they don't want to change their machines over to fill those kind of orders. So, sure. um, yeah, having that little bit of customer service with us and the ability to be, you know, not as compact and you know they they got big huge contracts with you sure. know department stores and stuff it allows us to free our machines up and uh you know help people out get their specialty wires and their oddball things and yeah. you know well 10 years ago so a, a note on the specialty wire so i've been following britain since uh, britain manufacturing since coming back at since this conversation with Britain. um you Talk about specialty wires. So they were running some the other day that was like uh, fluorescent red and fluorescent yellow, like a safety barricade, I suppose. Um, I mean, they can do just wild colors. They're also doing black and brown coated, galvanized, of course. Uh, but I think that that bears talking about that. I couldn't, I couldn't imagine the response uh, so from some of the manufacturers, not all the manufacturers, but some of them. Uh, if you asked for fluorescent red or yellow uh, fence wire, I mean, they, I just have to think that they might not be uh, as responsive to that. We've got some more fence fam showing up. Let's say hello real quick. Chris is here all the way from Grimsby, England. I hope I didn't butcher that. Grimsby, I suppose. Hello, Chris. Thank you for joining us. Tom Williams is back with us, North Florida, saying hello. Tom, I have to think your guys' weather down there is a little bit warmer than we find ourselves today. Uh, well, when I showed up, when I showed up this morning, it might be a degree or two warmer now, but it was about 19 outside. It's a little chilly. We'd prefer to have a little bit more of your weather. Hope, uh, hope, hope to see some warm weather down in New Orleans. I'm sure we will. 
Miguel says, Miguel from Lorraine, Ohio, says saying blessings. Miguel, blessings right back at you, buddy. I appreciate you stopping by. Landmark Creations, Kevin, hello, my friend. It's good to see you here in the chat as well. Guys, I'll take a quick break just to say that we're watching this week's video. Uh, today's video is going to be a little bit shorter, quite a bit shorter than normal. I'd like to keep it, you know, around, I, I said a half hour to an hour, but we're already 25 minutes in, so the half hour thing isn't going to happen. Uh, keep it around an hour. We've got to start tearing down the uh, studio here to box it up and have it ready to be uh, sent down to New Orleans. So anyway, and Valentine's Day dinner tonight for the for my wife and I. So anyway, let's continue on with the video. We're so those of you just joining. So we're having a conversation with Briss and Brenton about uh, the differences uh, between manufacturers of today and tomorrow as compared to the manufacturers from yesteryear, the one and, and national suppliers kind of get lumped in with this as well. But if you wanted three foot nine gauge, the answer would be, we'd sell you some six foot nine gauge and you could cut it down yourself <laughs> and knuckle it, uh, which isn't always the best answer. Uh, I'm familiar with cutting it down and knuckling it. Cause that's what we used to have to do to get five foot nine gauge yeah. for cantilever or cantilever gates for six foot fence measure five foot tall. And, uh, these hands have cut some <laughs> six foot nine gauge and yeah. knuckled it over. Yeah. Uh, but we do a lot of gate wire for people. Sure. Uh, yeah. We got a lot of people that, you know, if they got five foot gates, we'll, we'll, instead of making 60 inch, we'll make them 58 inch. Okay. So, okay. You know, just to, so they don't have to cut it and do it themselves. I mean, sure. It's just an easy switch on the machine. And I think this is incredible because those of you in the fence world that have built chain link gates know how much of just a tedious pain it is to cut wire down two inches to accommodate a gate. Um, you know, typically gates are two inches shorter than the fence that they're going on. If it's a swing gate, if it's a cantilever gate, typically they're a foot shorter. So, you know, you would see, you would see 60 inch wire, as I said in the video for uh six foot, six foot, a cantilever gate on a six foot fence. Uh, and then of course for regular swing gates, you'd be cutting down two inches of whatever size, what 48 down to 46, 60 down to 58, 72 down to 70 onward and onward and onward so the ability to make wire to the correct size out of the gate is tremendous i and the labor savings would have to be massive i mean over the course of a year right so on a per gate basis savings probably wouldn't be huge but if you make a fair amount of gates i think the labor savings could be uh, pretty significant Continuing on, you know, we've helped a lot of people out in that way. So, well, I think that's a good illustration yeah. of exactly what we're talking about. That you know, sometimes if you were to make a phone call to uh, one of the, one of the larger suppliers or manufacturers, we might say if you ask for fifty eight inch eleven <laughs> gauge, <laughs> you, you you might get hung up on. It. You might get hung up on. <laughs> they'll or, say or, okay might, and send you sixty. Yeah, or, or they'll say, <laughs> "Is this a prank? Yeah, Who right. set you up to this?" Yeah, yeah. But yeah, it's it's interesting to see how responsive operations like yours can be. And like I said, I'd like to get your opinion. What I, what I really see this becoming more normal. Yeah. I really see, not that it's abnormal. I don't mean to yeah, say no, that, no. but I, I really envision us as an industry getting away from having three or four large plants that do the commons a ton, but not much else to more of, operations that have maybe say 20 or less machines that seems like a good delineation yeah um what do, what do you think what are your thoughts on that yeah i think we're gonna i think we used to see it i think 10 10 years ago there was a lot more weavers on the market um and then they got bought up sure. you know these bigger companies bought these guys up because they saw the value in it too you know logistics obviously is a big part of it yeah um, and with how trucking's going and how it's kind of becoming yeah i think a lot more people are going to want to get machines for themselves that push a lot of volume and yeah it's going to kind of strategically help people um throughout the united states and i kind of think we're going to see more of that i do think the big corporations will let it happen for a while and then kind of buy the the small guys up again um I and i think that. you'll see that trend a little bit um but yeah i think we're kind of going that way that's kind of normal in other industries yeah. too yeah, that absolutely. you see you know, I, I think of in, in our in Springfield, we had just had a, a large uh, trash company come by a bunch of smaller trash companies. Yep. And in talking with some of these guys, that's kind of their business model is, 
you grow to a point where the larger company, you start becoming a pain to them and then they come acquire you. Yeah. It'd be interesting to see, you know, I, I could probably see that happening, yeah. especially as these machines, I mean, it, they're not easy to come by. No. You, you can't just go order one today and have it here next week. <laughs> oh yeah. They got long lead times, like everything. Sure. Um, yeah, sure. they take a minute to get, um, they take a minute to learn how to run. Um, but once you get the hang of it, I think it's, you know, it's doable. Uh, yeah. You know, it's, it's a lot of work, but you know, if you're willing to put in the work, yeah, absolutely. Well, I think also too, I think strategically, um, you know, if you look at the big boys, they're all kind of down in the South. Sure. A lot of Southern people. I think we're going to see a lot of Eastern, uh, a little bit Northern, more people kind of buying machines. Yeah. Um, just well, helping out. That was kind of part of the conversation we had had last night was that it's confusing to see, you know, these manufacturers show up around the coast because I mean, you, I don't, this is not a climate change discussion. And it, I, <laughs> I will not respond to climate change comments, but, but you are seeing more tropical storms come through the coast. Yeah. So it would seem like the, the obvious choice would start to bring those manufacturers inland away from, you know, away from this, yeah risk absolutely. but but you're right you see most of them in the south particularly around the coast probably because there's ports of entry there that are easy to get to um, that was a big decision for us bringing machines to casper wyoming is casper's we're 200 miles from the very center of the united states and okay. we're 400 miles from the center of north america and we thought, you know, we want to bring something to the heart. You know, I kind of feel like people are leaving the coast and coming more inland and into these places. Yep. Um, so I thought, hey, let's bring manufacturing into kind of the middle. I mean, I understand their strategic coastal, you know, they're getting foreign products. Uh, they're able to get them out on trains or get sure. them in on barges. Um, sure. So, yeah, I, I think uh, I think being on the coast, yes, you run into possibilities a hurricane can stop the whole operation and then we're back to huge price increases. So. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> we've seen crazy. it. Yeah, we've seen absolutely. that happen where, you know, manufacturers might not be directly impacted, but if the electrical grid's down, yeah. the, the machines won't run no matter how much you want them to. <laughs> You'll have to get a pretty big generator. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'd say so. So, yeah, I, I think that's the trend. I really do. And, and talking with you and talking about talking to other guys in the industry, I see this as being, you know, this you, you guys are kind of the beginning of this trend yeah. of having operations that are just more nimble, really. Yeah to, you know, changing demands and you're able to see, you know, demand in the marketplace, other places such as, you know, color coded, yeah. you know, that's, that's a video that uh, is coming up where we're going to talk about that. You guys do your own extruding. Yep. So you're able to see the, Hey, the extruded market here, there's a lot of demand. There's not as much supply. So yeah. we've got the capital available to invest in this equipment and now we provide it. Yeah, absolutely. On the extruding side, you know, extruding the wire. I mean, obviously everyone makes black and black's True. hard to come by, but you know, it's so special to cause like green and brown. Yeah. You know? yeah. Uh, I, I feel if you call up some of the bigger guys and ask for some <laughs> green and brown, they'll tell you six months, you know, yeah. eight months, maybe yeah. if they get to it, uh, yep. where what, we have it on the ground ready to go. And when people need it, we just, we, you know, our lead times are a little better sure. to help out. Sure. Yeah. Well, and, and yeah, cause I think in the, in the extruded market right now, you do hear that. So yeah. you can have any color you want as long as it's black yeah, to, yeah. to take from Henry yeah. Ford there. Yeah, yeah. There's a, just a massive amount of black, but not much brown or green in the yeah. market. Yeah. And then, I mean, there's even other colors I've seen, you know, yellow and white and red. And well, so we have a facility, a storage facility in town that's white <laughs> and it's all white. And, and that's kind of the ongoing uh, uh, conversation in our office with them is, you know, we, we, we bought a bunch and sat on it for a while because they're, it's a storage facility that's on a corner. They get hit fairly often. Yeah. Uh, but the conversation last time was, Hey guys, <laughs> there's not a lot of left, to, not a lot of this left. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, so you do see some specialty colors and that's something that, you know, an operation like this could probably change fairly quickly. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, something like white, say if you, you wanted to order white from us, I mean, we're talking six to eight weeks. I have woven, oh, wow. woven white chain link for you. That's incredible. Um, yeah, Rather than six to eight months. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's just the, got to order some pellets and sure. that's, that's the lead time for us is the pellets. And once okay. we have the pellets, we always got the wire. And, I mean, we can produce fast. So absolutely. interesting. It's yeah. good to know. I'll, I'll put that in my back pocket yeah. for sure. We can make sure. orange too. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, why in the world would that be a thing? Uh, so it's funny. There's a question that came up, uh, or no, a statement over on LinkedIn. Um, is Roger Bittencourt, um, he had made a comment about 
orange wire and i said if you let this cat out of the bag early i'm gonna bop you on the head but i uh, know it, it's funny that you know listen talking to briston i had no idea how available other colors were besides black i mean i think we've i mean we're used to hearing i mean going on for the last two years now uh that color coded really wasn't an option unless you were looking for black we have uh, we have a really good client here in town that they require green they want their fence to blend in with the natural uh, surroundings of the facility they're a, a, an outdoors type company and that's important to them uh so sourcing green wire a bit of a pain and then i went up to brent manufacturing met briston and gabe and the crew and uh come to find out green is not that hard to run so and it's funny to hear him talk about yellow and red now because i thought he was just throwing colors out at random and then you know probably two weeks after this video three weeks after this video uh i see videos from them on linkedin and facebook uh, producing this fluorescent yellow and really bright red uh wire so i think he probably had a he had a good idea that was coming up but anyway so anyway i say that to say it's interesting to know that you know really any any color is possible um the they to, to just reiterate what he said literally they're just um I don't want to say plastic beads or just vinyl beads um, that this machine melts down and extrudes over the wire. So we're going to have a video on exactly how this works. I could, I could spend the next half hour trying to explain it and I probably wouldn't do it justice. Uh, when the wire weaving video comes out, I also uh, recorded some content that we're going to tack on the back end of that video on the color coding because it is a fantastic process to watch. Uh, watch it go from these beads, these colored beads, into color coded wire i mean in a in a matter of minutes it is fast this process interesting because uh yeah we do need some fence at the office so yeah. those of you at the office watching uh stay tuned <laughs> uh and then without going too deep into it you guys also have kind of some more news that's on the horizon too yeah, uh, some more demand that you've seen in the market that you guys are are kind of taking up the the mantle for yeah we got some big things coming um i think we're gonna make a big impact on the market to really help out some contractors and you know help kind of supply more people yeah. um kind of make it more of a competitive and you know equal thing kind of sure. to level the playing field across the united states uh yeah that's gonna be coming here in july august uh we got some big news so yeah. we're excited to announce it uh, so. And we've already discussed, I'm excited to come back and, and do a video specifically on that because I think you're right. I think it's going to, I think it's going to change, you know, kind of the way people look at the industry, maybe. Yeah. I bring, bring a little bit more eco-friendly twist to the industry. Yeah, absolutely. Very interesting. So what, what more is, or what have, what haven't we talked about as far as, you know, the, and, and I don't want to minimize your guys' operation by just saying the small operator versus the maybe the corporate. So maybe that's the delineation, the private versus the corporate yeah. manufacturer. What do you see on your end? I mean, you obviously see it day to day. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, if you, you, you take companies that have a hundred machines um, and then you take us that have four, you know, the, that hundred machines, most of the time, not all hundred machines are running. You sure. know, they, even they're running a handful um, with our four machines. We can produce 80,000 feet a week. Which Dang. for us, I mean, that's, it's big, it's you know, quite a bit. we run a night shift and a day shift and, uh, we can, we can push out some serious product. I mean, we're talking four or five trucks a, a week. Um, sure. And I, I, with these bigger guys, you know, they, they tend to have more orders, you know, yeah. bigger customers. So their lead times are further, but if their production's not there, you know, which, I mean, if they're running their machines at 500 RPM compared to us at 950, I mean, it's like I have two of their machines, Sure, you know? Sure. So, um, I think you find out that I, you know, I don't think it's about the, the quantity of machines. I think yeah. it's about the quality and the, uh, just being uh, efficient. Well, you know, you, you, I think you hit on something there in that you guys have some personnel here that absolutely make these machines, huh? Yep. Yeah, I mean, we, we saw that firsthand yesterday. Uh, we came in one of the machines said it was down at a, at a miss weave or something. And within minutes, that thing was back up and operational and rolling out more, more, uh, chain link. Yeah. So I, I think you're hitting on something there and we talked about it earlier, but in talk, in terms of personnel, yeah. right. So one thing that we're seeing too is the difference in, um, in hiring practices, 
and and compensation and just how how these you know team members are treated in a privately owned operation versus you know more of a, a corporate type yeah. operation, um, which probably again makes all the difference in the world when you're looking at output. Yeah, absolutely. I think that the the big guys still do it well. Don't get sure. me wrong. Sure. Um, I think these little guys like us, and you know, as we get bigger, are just kind of come draw their attention more. Sure. You know, I mean, we, we sell the big guys as well. well um, and, and here's the thing. So we talk about this a lot when we're talking about multiple fence companies in the same city, not necessarily being competitors. Yeah. I mean, the, the pie is so large that one fence company couldn't possibly cover the needs of that community. Yeah. I think we're having that same conversation now on the national scale yeah. that there's so much demand for fencing in general that, not one, not two, not three manufacturers could take care of that. And we're seeing that, yeah. right? When we're talking about 20 week lead times on some common sized wire, I think that's very obviously a sign that there's more demand than supply. Yeah, galvanized wire specifically is, I mean, it's a sought after thing. I mean, we use galvanized wire in all sorts of applications from vineyards, uh, yeah. you know, power lines. I mean, all sorts of things have galvanized wire. Um, and us weavers, you know, we're, they kind of, these bigger companies that sell strand, you know, they don't make strand specifically for weaving. Sure. It is a weaving wire, but they're making other wires as they're making the weaving wire. So, um, yeah, I think having a demand for these wires is, is kind of growing the, you know, growing the need for it. And, sure. and it's, it's not there, you know, there's only so many people that make rod in the United States. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's hard to get stuff off barges, obviously get foreign things. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's hard, you know, I mean, I can't imagine these bigger companies that have a hundred machines, you know, if we're doing 80,000 feet, they gotta be doing, you'd think half a million, you know, sure. at a hundred machines. I mean, yeah. and, but if you add that up, I mean, that's, million a pounds a week kind of thing i mean so yeah I, I think the the demand is is a little high and it'd be nice to see more people on the market that can provide galvanized wire to people sure so. sure well and and provide exactly what they need yeah you know just to circle back around to that conversation about 58 inch wire yeah that you guys are more able to quickly take care of market needs too yeah. um, and and you're filling a need that's simply not being met yeah. Right. So it's not that it's taking away from anyone. It's simply filling gaps and supplying demand that's being not met, unmet. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, everyone's had big lead times for everything, you know, sure. and our, our lead times just got better with the, the adding of the machines. But, you know, our, our typical lead times, three to four weeks, you know, on a, on an order. Um, sometimes we can make it faster. If we got yeah. it in stock and you need one extra pallet, whoop, whoop throw it on that pallet, you know, throw that on the machine and say, Hey, this guy needs some nine foot. Let's get it done. And the yeah. truck's out the door. So, yeah. Well, now that was one of the conversations we had yesterday too, is I, um, I was looking at eight foot nine gauge of truckload and from two of the manufacturers, their reply was 18 weeks. Yeah. So we can have it to you in 18 weeks. And then to which you responded like, well, I could beat that <laughs> by a fair margin. Probably. Yeah, I think I said I had some of it sitting, yeah, it's out, there sitting out there right now, actually. actually yeah. I think I could have it there before you got home. Before I, <laughs> that's exactly <laughs> what you said. That yeah. wire could beat you home. Yeah. So. Uh, but I, I think that illustrates the point. Yeah. Right. That having, having these privately owned independent manufacturing facilities throughout the United States is really where things are going because <laughs> It really fills a need. Now, I don't see it taking away from these nationals because no. they're producing, you know, six foot, nine gauge knuckle twist, the kind of the bread and butter of commercial fencing or something. Yeah. Uh, but because they're so busy supplying that, they just don't have capacity for others. So I, I, don't, I don't think they mind it. I think these no. bigger companies, it, it frees their machines up a little bit to kind of work on that six yeah. foot, nine gauge orders. Yeah. Um, and it, it doesn't take from them. I mean, you no. might be a, a merchant's metals customer and then you buy from us. Merchant's metals probably turns more people down. You know what I mean? Yeah. Just because their lead times are, they just don't have the volume. Well, it, and in your, in your beginning illustration, three foot tall, nine gauge. I yeah. mean, it's, they're simply not going to have the ability no. to produce that anytime soon. So for, to them, for you to produce that, like you said, kind of takes that burden off them of worrying right. about, Hey, we're going to need to shut down a machine. We're going to have to retool it. We're going to, have to do all this, yeah. or we can keep producing all this wire that's currently in high demand. Yeah. So 
the way I kind of picture this is, so again, we have multiple fence companies in a community, but some of them specialize in wood and some of them specialize in chain link, some of them specialize in vinyl. Yeah. They're not really each other's competitors, <laughs> right? Because the guy that installs vinyl might not like to do chain link at all. So when he gets that call for chain link, this happens a lot in our office where we don't do vinyl. So if we get a call in for someone that wants a vinyl privacy fence, we explain we simply don't do it. However, here's a couple of good options. Yeah. You know, this, that's kind of really how I see this happening is to the, to the large national manufacturers, you guys are a nice augmentation to what they offer yeah. because again, three foot nine gauge, they're not going to, they're not going to be interested in shutting a machine down to run a truckload of that or no, something like yeah, that. Absolutely. So yeah. I think, I, I think when I've had this conversation with other people, there's been kind of a hesitation that says, well, I don't know, like the, these other suppliers aren't going to like it. And then there could be some infighting and which could be, I mean, you see that on the fencing, the install side that you still see guys in the same community, maybe not fight, but just not get along because they think they're each other's competitors. Yeah. I can see that on the national scale too. But I think the biggest takeaway here is that independent operators are really providing a needed augmentation to that national and that we can all get along together. Yeah. Right? There's no need for this infighting. There's uh, definitely enough work for everyone. Yeah. I and mean, that's how I've kind of felt. I mean, and it's, it's just, you'd be surprised. I think when you realize who's selling to who and, you yeah. know, I mean, there's people, people don't know about and, you know, be everyone stays in business and is happy. I, sure. I think there's enough for everyone. So. Absolutely. Well, guys, let me know what you think in the comments below. I'd really like to, to continue this discussion, maybe in the comments section. Uh, we discussed uh, that I'll be coming back for a, or for a big announcement here uh, later on this year, middle of the year. So, so maybe we could continue this conversation then uh, based on comments that you guys leave in the comments below. As we wrap this up, I want to say thank you. I've said it in other videos, but I want to make sure I say it here too, that you guys have been such gracious hosts. So that's basically the video. I go on to say that I go on to thank Briston uh, for the fact that, as I was saying right there, he was such a gracious host. Uh, him, Gabe, Kyle, the whole crew was just so great. Um, the guys on the floor were more than accommodating. When I was when I was filming the videos, both of the wire weaving machines and the extrusion machine, everyone there was was open at answering questions. They were pointing things out. They're like, "Hey, you might have missed this." Did you know about this thing about it? Or did you know about this point? So I, like I said, you know, if you guys are watching this over at Brenton, I really appreciate you having me out, um, you know, for a business, you know, they didn't shut down operations, but they, they certainly didn't work at peak efficiencies either because they had me kind of bumping around wanting to take videos and reshoot videos and that sort of thing. Um, I, I appreciate that. It really made it, uh, really made it easy to get in and get out. Um, you guys have wire needs you should certainly check out brent manufacturing um they keep a pretty decent supply on the ground that's one thing i kind of saw uh while i was shooting video the b-roll didn't make it in this video but uh there's there's some uh, b-roll there of just mountains mountains of this strand just waiting to be woven um so if you guys are looking for wire and you're the response you're getting back is uh you know this this 16 18 20 week lead time you got to give the guys at Brenton, uh, Brenton a shot at it. So they were, like I said, the eight foot nine gauge, they had a truckload sitting there, literally ready to go. Uh, unfortunately, we had just got one in, or else I would have, you know, to, just have nothing else to say thank you, uh, shot that truckload straight down here. Now, the prices are seem to be competitive with what we're seeing in the market, and it's faster. So, you know, if as a business owner, you know, I can tolerate a little bit more expensive of a material if it gets to me sooner, you know, if I need it. So it's the, it's the, you know, what does it cost not to have it available sort of conversation? Uh, anyway, let me know what you guys think about that video. I think uh, the guys down in Britain are doing a credit or up at Britain. Wyoming is north of Missouri uh, are doing a great job up there. They've got some, uh, they've got some big news coming out in uh midsummer june july thereabouts that i'm going to head back up and cover um like i said it's, it's going to be impactful in the industry and i think it's uh worth discussing i'm excited to be a part of the announcement of that i i'm i guess not be a part of the cover the announcement if you will 
Anyway, I thought that was interesting. So from the first time I saw one of those wire weave machines uh, in the review video, it was probably a month and a half ago. I was like, man, I want to see one of those things. I got to see these things work. And as I said in the video, Gabe reached out almost the day that thing, that video came out. Um, booked a flight right then and uh, off we went because I wanted to see these things work. Truly, truly impressive. Um, but what do you guys think as far as the conversation goes um, for the industry skewing more towards independent manufacturers, independent uh, suppliers, wholesalers, that sort of thing. Uh, it'd be interesting to hear what you guys think. Um, one thing we're seeing here in our local market is a need for more supply in general, right? So uh, we've always sold, maybe not always sold retail, but for the last 20 years or so, we've sold retail here uh, out of the fence company. So we primarily installed fence and then we also sold fittings if somebody needed some. Um, especially last year, what we're starting to see is more of a transition into our wholesale side. Our retail side took off, but then also our whole side, wholesale side took off too uh, from people that, that also held accounts at these national wholesalers, um, but needed odds and ends that either they couldn't get or maybe were uh, misshipped, that sort of thing. Um, you know, we're, we're seeing that more and more become, become commonplace, right? So more independent wholesalers and suppliers, that sort of thing. Let me know what you guys think. I'd, I'd be interested in having this conversation on, um, kind of where the industry's going, maybe, uh, more towards, a. I started off, you know, when, when I was, when I had this thought a few months ago, when I started developing this thought a few months ago, it was, uh, the term I used was regional. Uh, more regional manufacturers, regional wholesalers, that sort of thing. Uh, but in today's day and age, there's no reason for it to be regional, right? So uh, shameless plug, we sell we sell chain link fence fittings online, ozfence.store. Um, but we're shipping those things all over the country. You know, I mean, it's there's a box ready. I, I boxed it up right before this, uh, right before we started this live, headed down to Texas. You know, so we've also shipped um, this week that I could think of. We shipped to California. We shipped to Virginia. Um, we had one to Ohio. Where else? Just kind of everywhere, right? So uh, regional really isn't the term. So maybe uh, independent is a term. Or I think in this video, we used kind of corporate versus private. Uh, so that's kind of another interesting discussion uh, that a lot of these wholesalers, not a lot, but several, quite a few wholesalers are being uh, suppliers are being purchased by holding companies, right? Investment firms. So um, they're actually, so just in the fence news, there was, um, there was a group that went and acquired, you know, several. So that, you know, uh, uh, MMI got acquired. Um, Benford got acquired. There's some, there's a few down in Florida that got acquired by the same group. So a bit more of a consolidation. So you hope, that consolidation is for the better, right? So that, you know, now that these companies are all held within the same group, maybe there's efficiencies, right? There's efficiencies of scale that when they were, when all these companies were on their own, they simply couldn't take advantage of. But now that with, when they're under the same umbrella, uh, they do is the hope, right? And that's probably why the holding company, you know, made that decision was hoping for those efficiencies, efficiencies of scale that led to profits. You know, I mean, that's, that's why we're in business, right? Is, is to make money. So you hope, uh, but we've also seen in the market, um, acquisitions that don't lead to better supply. If anything, sometimes they lead to, uh, less supply in the market. So, you know, a holding company buys, I don't know, a lumber mill, um, you know, or a, a company that makes fence pickets, you know, and, uh, promptly start shutting factories down. Interesting, right? So the supply goes down, the price goes up. Not too shabby for the holding company, not too great for the fencing industry. So let's hope that's not the direction uh, we're headed uh, after this latest round of consolidation. Um, but anyway, I say all that to say, I really see the opportunity for more independent operators um, to start becoming more normal, right? So uh, whether we're talking about manufacturers, wholesalers, suppliers, whatever you want to call them, um, I think I think we start seeing this become more of a mainstream thing, 
but let me know what you guys think. I mean, this is one guy's opinion. This is my opinion, right? So I'd love to hear what you guys think. I, I'm open to suggestions, right? So this isn't anything that's written in stone. Uh, but when you start seeing, you know, when you start seeing writing on a wall, you, you start putting the words together and figuring out what uh, what the intent is. Let's say hi to a few people that showed up during that video. I, I think we might have already said hi hello to Kevin. As I clicked that, I thought, you know, anyway. But hello, Kevin. So Kevin was uh, the first ever winner of Spend a Day with the Expert. Uh, he came in last month at the end of the month and we did a spend the day with the expert and if you guys are following the channel you know that we're currently we opened up another round uh another contest for a spend a day spend a day with the expert so if you if you'd like to come spend a day with the team you plus one other person i would like to come spend a day with me and my team uh going through you know getting to meet the team but then also really spending a day full of business development I mean, we're happy to show you how we do it, but also we're, you know, so what, what we did with Kevin was we shared with him our processes, our procedures, but then also a decent part of the day was spent just having a conversation on his business and it what he needed help with and really just kind of bouncing off ideas off each other. If that sounds interesting to you. If you'd like to participate, then there's a link in the comments so if you're watching on YouTube, it's in the description below. If you're watching on Facebook or LinkedIn, it's actually in the comments below. Anyway, there's a link somewhere below to enter the contest. Uh, the contest goes through the end of this month. So the end of February, which we are, I was going to say we're quickly coming up on it. We're not really. It's only the 12th, right? But with, uh, with the events going on in the next few weeks, the end of the month will be here before we know it. So it goes through the end of the month. Then Jeremy and I kind of sit down and we've got the the uh, thankless task of trying to go through and choose a winner. And what we learned is it is not an easy uh, decision making process. So uh, but if it's inter if you if it sounds interesting to come spend the day with me and the team, be sure to uh, to drop that in below or to click the link below to enter the contest. Now it is all expenses paid. So uh, in Kevin's example, it was him and his father. Uh, we paid to fly him out. We put him up in a hotel. Actually, it was it was a neat hotel. It's the, and we're going to continue to put people up there. It's a uh, Angler's Lodge or Angler's Inn, Angler's Lodge, I believe, uh, right across the street from Bass Pro Shops. Now, Springfield, Missouri, is the world headquarters of Bass Pro Shops, so it's the largest one in the world. Um, yeah, so we got to skip over there and kind of see the sights. Anyway, if that sounds interesting. Link is in the description or the comments below. Miguel, sorry for, I saw this come up when we were about halfway through that video, but rather than, than stop the video and change conversations, I figured we'd wait till now. I want to start using and promoting the uh, post. I think I think the product you're talking about is maybe the, the Master Halco Postmaster Plus. Now, what do you think? Should I stick with wood or, or the Pro Post? So, the, the Postmaster, I believe, like I said, is, is a product we're talking about. We've used it for years now. Um, I love using it. I really do. So when lumber when lumber skyrocketed and became scarce, we started using uh, Postmaster Post just as our exclusive post option. Um, I mean, they obviously aren't going to rot. Right? They've got a lifetime warranty against rust and decay. They're also not going to warp or twist. Now, this might sound like a promotion. It's not. I don't receive any special uh, special benefits from uh, Master Halco. Uh, we certainly pay retail for these things. Uh, however, I love using them. I mean, they're easy to use. And from a value perspective to the client, there's nothing like them on the market. Well, okay. There's something like them on the market. There are other versions. Uh, so the patent of the Postmaster original post came up, and then you, you started seeing... Um, I wouldn't call them replicas, I guess, but uh, very close uh, representations of the Postmaster Post. So then Master Alco came out with the Postmaster Plus. So the dimensions are a little bit different. It has more um, attachment holes sort of thing, but I like using them. So they're not going to warp. They're not going to twist. They're not going to rot. The three reasons we replace the majority of wood posts, 
right? So the other ones are a car driving through it or severe storm damage. And at that point, you're going to be replacing that post no matter what it is. Um, we like them and, and we use it as a way of separating ourselves, right? So gosh, my years get all mixed up, but probably six or seven years ago, we really made a big push, uh, by we shot videos, we did promotional posts, we did blog articles about why residents in our area should request the postmaster post because it was a natural transition to a better product that you really don't see right so you cover the pick it up on the inside well depending if you install it per manufacturer's recommendations um you cover the post up on both sides it disappears that sort of thing um so we made a big marketing push the handy thing about this is we were the only ones offering it at the time so no one in the market was like they might offer them i guess but no one was stocking them and no one was offering it to each and every job they went on so we did a big marketing push we ordered a bunch in we did a big marketing push saying for your next finish you should request the postmaster post knowing that we were the stocking dealer in the area for these postmaster posts now fast forward to today everyone and their brother in the market offers them because everyone started requesting them. So for, for a little bit, it made us a little bit different. It gave us that competitive advantage over our, uh, other, the other companies in the area. So, uh, would I recommend it? Yes, absolutely. I would start marketing it, uh, as a premium product that it is right. So the number one reason for wood fun, wood fence replacement is rotted posts and it's not even close. So to get away from that, we now offer the Postmaster Plus steel post. It's a lifetime warranty post against corrosion and rust. Uh, it'll keep your fence looking great for a lifetime sort of thing. That's the message, right? So, yep, I absolutely agree, and I think it would be great. Navy May says, hi from Virginia Beach. Hello. I actually had some uh, family in Virginia Beach there for a while. Uh, what are your thoughts on using perma column deck post as fence post anchors bases? Not familiar, but I will look it up real quick. Perma column, let's see, perma column deck post. Let's look it up, shall we? Perma column deck post. Okay. So no, these aren't called perma column. Okay, precast deck post provide permanent solution. So it's a pre precast concrete post. So I'm all in on this idea because so DNJ projects over in Nottingham. So their videos were the first I'd seen of a precast concrete post. It's incredibly common over there. The soil conditions are very wet. I mean, it's the UK, which they've been known to have quite a lot of rain. Um, so they're used to trying to address rot. I mean, it's where the uh, post saver post leave came from, uh, just because they had so much rain that it led to a lot of rot. Um, yeah, so I so the perma column deck post is, it, this might be the US's version of these. It's a precast concrete product. I like it. I think uh, it could be really useful, especially so Virginia Beach also, uh, probably an area that gets high winds. So being that it's pre-stressed con pre concrete, uh, it would actually be incredibly durable for that. Um, also, you know, you're also on the coast, so you get salt as a uh, concern for, especially for these metal posts uh, where concrete, it probably would be somewhat of a concern. I mean, so these are going to have rebar inside as part of the pre-stressed uh, process. But yeah, I think... I think in your area, I think in any area, the precast con the precast concrete post is a great option. Now, the downside is they are going to be heavy. I mean, it's concrete, right? So there, there's always pros and cons. So, but I think it'd be worth looking into if you can get them in your area. Uh, I think it'd be an incredibly durable option for you. Michael Mavitt says it's four degrees in Michigan. You can keep that. You just keep that to yourself. It's 19 here, and that is plenty cold. I don't I have no need for four-degree weather at all. It was 55 yesterday. It is 19 today. What 
in the polar vortex is going on around here. I don't know that it's a polar vortex, but that's what everyone says when it gets cold. So I suppose that's what it is. Correct me if you know what it's actually called. Dan Blanc, the fence king, we're coming to your neck of the woods on Tuesday. Actually, so today's Saturday, so he's probably uh, already in New Orleans. I think he was said that he was going to be down the weekend before, through the weekend after fence tech. So congrats if you're already there, Dan. Orange, glad we did make an orange joke today. No, I enjoy orange jokes, Dan. I'm not happy. I'm not glad that you didn't make orange jokes. I would be happy if you did make an orange joke. For instance, Orange, you glad you picked Ozark Fence. That's my favorite tagline ever. Now, we don't use it enough because I'm, me and my dad are some two of the only people here that find that joke hilarious. Um, I mean, everyone else kind of chuckles, but I'm all in on this Orange, you glad you picked Ozark Fence. I mean, for crying out loud, there's enough orange around here that everyone gets it, right? I mean, on our Facebook page, I think it's every Saturday, there's an orange joke that pulls up. And they're usually dad jokes because I'm the one that scheduled them and I like dad jokes. So, no, Dan, I'm not happy that you didn't make an orange joke today. Anyway, can't wait to see you on Tuesday. Looking forward to it. I'm looking forward to seeing all of the fence fam on Tuesday. But we will be in Dan's neck of the woods. We'll be in his backyard, so to speak. Guys, if you haven't hit the like button, hit that like button. Let Facebook and YouTube and LinkedIn, wherever you're watching this, know. We're producing some mediocre to decent content here. Sudzio says, sounds like fun. I agree. I'm not sure what, what we're talking about that sounds like fun. Maybe FinSec. FinSec is going to be an incredibly fun time. Um, it's going to be a lot of work. So I was, I was talking with my wife about this the other night. She's like, well, I mean, I'm sure you'll have a lot of fun. Like, well, it, Yes. I will. I'm not going to make it sound dreadful. However, we're showing up to film YouTube content. I want to bring you guys that aren't able to make it into FinSTech to see what was there and all that. Um, you know, what products were available, what sessions went on that, that you may have missed. Uh, give you guys a peek about what FinSTech is because there's a lot of folks, you know, that there's different reasons why people aren't going. We'll leave that at that. However, there's one of the concerns is they just, people don't know what it is. You know, if you've never been to FinSec before, I, so before my first FinSec, I had no idea what this was. I thought it was a trade show, really, something similar to like a home builder show or a lawn and garden show, but for fence guys. And it's a little like that. I mean, there are booths with suppliers and all that, but there's also educational seminars and while there are booths and suppliers, there's, there's a whole extra layer on top of this in that you get to see some fence fam that you haven't seen in a while, right? Last year, uh, fence tech in Nashville was unfortunately canceled by the city of Nashville. Um, to my understanding, but, um, so we haven't seen each other in a while. Some of us now, some of us still got together in Nashville last year. We already had travel planned. Uh, we did a standing university right there. So, some of us still made it happen, but some of us didn't. So it's always good to see each other. And then, so the networking is a huge part of it. But anyway, it is a lot of fun. It's also a little bit of work if you're showing up to create content. We're, we've got, we got four days to create a lot of content. And, you know, each evening, the manufacturers typically have dinners. There's an awards dinner one night. There's breakfast. There's all the, and you're trying to create content in the middle of that. So. We're going to see how that works, but it is fun. Nick says, are you seeing an increased demand for staining and restoration versus new installs with the increased material cost? Yes, absolutely. So we, we saw a tremendous, a tremendous increase in yeah cleaning and restoring business over replacement because the replacement cost is expensive and it's a natural discussion, right? To say, you know, this project may have been twelve or fifteen thousand dollars to replace, or I could do a great job at cleaning this, staining it, and you could get several more years out for three or four thousand dollars or a third of the cost. I'm making numbers up, but that's the idea. For significantly less than what it would cost to replace this fence, I can clean it, 
stain and seal it. It's going to look great, and it's going to prolong the life of this fence uh, along the way. And it's a win-win, right? So the customer can push that transaction cost further down the line, a few more years into the future, see if costs might come down. They're probably not going to. Um, but also as a contractor, you still get full margins, right? So we're not talking about discounting our services. We're not talking about taking less or doing more for the same amount of money. So we're simply going to change what that transaction is. We're going to clean it. We're going to stain it. We're going to make it look great, but it's a win for you to cost savings for you, but it's also a win for me because I still get our full margins here as a business, which is what we need to be able to be here when that fence does need replaced. So the question, are you seeing an increase in demand? The answer is absolutely. So staining and sealing, um, it, it's the highest demand I've seen it, you know, just because of, and it's exactly related to uh, the increased material cost for sure. Well, guys, like I said, this is going to be a little bit quicker of a live. If you guys have any last minute questions or comments or just want to, give a shout out by all means do that real quick i'd like to wrap this up in the next couple minutes so uh if you guys are wondering where i'll be if you'd like to connect with me in person on my facebook page which is facebook.com forward slash the real joe everest let me type this in the comments below actually so facebook.com forward slash the real joe everest because apparently there are a few on Facebook, and I don't know any of them but me. Uh, Facebook.com forward slash The Real Joe Everest. On the events tab on, my, on that page, you will see for the next two months where I'm going to be, which is we've got three meet and greets scheduled for Fintech at the My Salesman booth, at the Saint Steel Experts booth, and at the Mr. Fence Tools booth. But also, we've got Staining University coming up, which is a free training event. It's a, it is a three-day training event now. So we've added another day because we're adding more content. And if you guys have been to these before, you know it's like drinking from a fire hose, right? So there's a lot of content. There's a lot of information getting put out into this training event. So we're bringing even more training in on the power washing side. So we're adding another day three-day event still for free which i think is amazing um in nashville or outside nashville and lebanon it is lebanon i have confirmed that we have a lebanon missouri here they have a lebanon tennessee some people want to call it lebanon i've been told that is incorrect it is lebanon tennessee uh, the sign up for that is also in the description below or the comments below depending on where you're watching it it is somewhere below this exact video um, the sign up registration link for Staining University. I can't wait to see you guys there either. Um, both of these events, both FinSec and Staining University, are going to be incredible. Uh, we're still actually internally, we're having a discussion on Monday on whether we're attending uh, Social Media Marketing World. Still a bit of a question mark there. Uh, but as soon as we do get that scheduled, if we're going, I'll let you guys know. So if you guys are interested in content marketing, and basically what I talk on at these training events, uh, social media marketing world is where it's at. They have training, they have training lanes, lanes, tracks, training tracks for all sorts of social media, YouTube, Facebook, LinkedIn are the kind of the big three Instagram and TikTok. So two years ago was the last social media marketing world. And everyone was like, a little confused on what TikTok was. There was a dentist called the dentist that was just setting TikTok on fire at the moment. He's still setting it on fire, but at the moment he was really the one, maybe not the one, but one of the few professionals on TikTok. And now look at everybody, right? So it's that sort of thing. So there, we're going to discuss basically the current state of social media marketing and what it looks like moving forward. Are there new platforms? Is there emerging uh, platforms, emerging technology that makes production on these platforms better. Uh, is there new audio gear? Or is there new streaming software? That sort of thing. Uh, that would be probably in the YouTube track. Or maybe in the, the audio gear that I found here, I actually found it as, not found it, but I heard about it through Social Media Marketing World's podcast track. So Because in podcast, it is all about the audio. So 
and especially in video too. So that's a tip for you guys that everyone talks about is that if you're making video, people will put up with me mediocre video content. They will not put up with mediocre audio content. So even if you're making video, you got to make sure that audio is crispy clean or else if it's staticky or if it just doesn't sound right, people don't want to watch it for whatever reason. They will put up with uh, subpar uh, video. They will not put up with subpar audio. So we will know more on Monday if if we are turn if we are attending social media marketing world. And if we are, we'll provide the dates for that and probably the sign up link for social media marketing world. I'm not affiliated with those folks. I just like attending, and I would love to see you guys there because it's basically agencies there. Not to say anything about agencies you're in a social media marketing agency then i'm probably not talking to you but it's mainly agency folks there right very few tradesmen and women trades folks attend this so and actually that's so that's kind of what how i got started in youtube was i met a guy named roger wakefield who is the expert plumber on youtube and the reason i met him was we were three and um oh man i space on the name um there was a drywaller and we were like the three trades people at this social media marketing world and this is the first one i went to i want to say it's four or five years ago everyone else was agencies um or there there were also like influencers there like instagram influencers that sort of thing uh, because that is a track on social media mark in the social media marketing world training uh anyway I'd love to see more trades folks there, specifically Fencer. If, if the Fence fam can take over social media marketing world, that would be fantastic. I would love that a lot. So anyway, I will let you guys know if we are attending social media marketing world. I don't see any comments come in, so I assume you guys are good to go. We will probably wrap this up now and start deconstructing the studio here and packing it up and getting it ready to send to New Orleans. Guys, if you do have any more questions or comments, leave them in the comments below. I watch the comments. They, I get notifications on my phone after the lives as comments come through. I'm always happy to help however I can. Till next time, I'm Joe Everest, the fence expert, reminding you that good fences make good neighbors. And I'll see you next time. Or in person if you're coming to one of these events.